Welcome back to Nassau COBA Monthly. I am Brian Sullivan, president of the Nassau County Correction Officers Benevolent Association. We're going to get right back into it. This month, we're going to change things up a little bit. The last the last uh, couple of podcasts that we did, we were speaking a little bit more of the, the bigger issues. We were speaking about bail reform and, and a lot of stuff that's going on in Albany. I'll touch a little bit at the end of today's podcast on that stuff again, just to give some updates. But uh, today we're going to get a little technical. We have in the in the studio with us today Brian Doyle, second vice president of the union. Say hello, Brian. Hello, Sully. Thanks for the promotion, third vice president. There you go. <laughs> well, maybe we should redo that. You think the president of friggin' union would know that he was the second, not the third? I'm used to being here with John Hogan. That's why he's the second vice president. Whatever, leave it in there. It is what it is. And we also have our attorney from Kohler and Isaacs, Liam Castro, who does who handles all of our arbitrations and court cases. Say hello, Liam. Hello, Sully. Thanks for having me. Very nice. Good to have you here today. Um, I'm gonna. We're just gonna kick it around a little bit here. We're gonna talk about the uh, the the disciplinary process and the grievance process in our contract. One thing that never ceases to amaze uh, union people is how much uh, their union members do not know about their contract. In the past, we've had actually union members who don't know as much about their contract, union delegates, union uh, executive people that should brush up on things. So we have Brian Doyle in the in the uh, the studio today with Liam, and we're going to talk about the grievance process, the disciplinary process, and we'll, and we'll take it from there. I'll kick it over a little bit to Brian now if you want to go through the uh, the contract just so we know what we're talking about, and then we'll get involved in some cases and what we've been doing. Okay. Um just talking about parameters, guidelines, um, procedures, timeframes, things of that nature. For individual grievances, it's important to realize that you have four calendar months from um, the occurrence of a, an event that you feel that you're aggrieved of or four calendar months after the employee member should have known of its occurrence. Um when in regard to class action grievances, that time frame is extended um, to one calendar year. So if it involves more than one person, um, it could be made a class action, which the president of the union files um, right to labor relations, doesn't need to go to the uh, preliminary steps before that. Uh, regarding discipline, if something is a little bit more fast paced, uh, upon the imposition of discipline or notice of personal action, the NOPAs that are handed out, uh, an employee has 25 calendar days uh, to grieve um, the discipline that was handed down. So typically uh, we get served the NOPAs along with the member. Uh, we know that the, the NOPA, that somebody has been disciplined. So we take um, the initiative and, and get the uh, disciplinary no uh grievances, uh, you know, written and get the member in as soon as possible in order to, uh, to not have an issue with that time frame. That's the, that's the biggest difference we have between grievances and when our members get disciplined is we will get simultaneously served in the union the notice of what's called a notice of personnel action. That's the, that's the discipline itself. The, the member either gets served in person or they get served by certified mail and the union gets served simultaneously. <clears throat> what's different about grievances with that is that a lot of times we may not know about the grievance unless the member tells us that somebody could have a problem with their – uh, with either you know something going on with their with their health insurance, they, there's something going on that they they had their post changed, they had something go on, whatever may may have violated the contract. If we don't know about it, you know somebody has to tell us about it. We don't necessarily know about it, and, and we've had uh, things in the past where a member will come to us and say. You know, six months ago, so and so happened to me, and they owe me money for this. And we have to, you know, we end up being the bad guy because we have to tell them that, you know, this is an individual case for you. You had four months to make a grievance on that, and you're outside of the the parameters of that. So that's what, you know, a lot a lot of times gets lost in the translation. That's why we want to make sure that people people really need to know what's in there, what's in their contract. Yeah, it, it is important, and and like you said, we have to live within the guidelines that are set that we've agreed on in the CBA. Oftentimes, like you said, Sully, people people try to resolve issues on their own or they don't want to go to the union right away, but that's what we're here for. We're, we're here to, to uh, address the issues that, you know, and, and enforce the contract as written. So it is important to come forward and, uh, and let us know of issues, um, whether you're sure if it's an issue or not, whether it's a contract grievance or we talk often about grievances and gripes. 
if it's a, a, a contract grievance, certainly we could address it. The gripes also we could address, you know, going through, you know, uh, talking to administration, administrators and things of that nature, trying to resolve it informally, you know, whatever the issue is. But that's why the union's here. Um, getting back to the procedure, uh, once the grievance is filed and has gone through, you know, the various steps, it is uh, then that uh, a grievance can be uh, put forward for arbitration. Um, move on to the arbitration uh, schedules that we have throughout the year. In uh, November of any given year, we have um, we do a scheduling process for we set a calendar for the upcoming year, where we have uh, six arbitrators on our panel. Uh, each arbitrator gets four dates for the upcoming year. And we schedule with them in November. We, we spread the dates out throughout the year. So we have 24 dates throughout the year. Each arbitrator can get um, one uh, continuation of a, a grievance for a total of 30 arbitration dates throughout the year. So with, you know, a, a membership of nearly 900 employees, those dates could very quickly get uh, eaten up. So um, th there are times, although we have moved through a tremendous backlog of, of grievances. We, we've been able to resolve uh, a lot of them. Um, we are getting things heard much quicker than what they were in the past. Um, we're actually be able to, uh, to propose grievances for arbitration that, that have happened within this year. So that, that is something that is, um, that we've worked hard to do to, to get rid of the backlog. So we had a, uh, an issue back years ago when I was, when I was in the union in my last incarnation, we had, uh, a lot of, a lot of grievances that should have been that, that just backed up when I, when I first got in the union back in 2004, 2005, uh, Brian uh, Doyle just hit on it before that the differences between gripes and grievances <clears throat> a lot of times they you know depending on who's handling cases and things like that they'll they'll grieve what is actually a gripe back in 2004 when we first took over the union we had about 250 275 outstanding grievances and disciplines and things like that and and a lot of these things never should have been grievances in the first place they, a grievance is something that's actually in your contract that violates a part of your contract gripes and, and certain types of disciplines that should have been handled on the command level, which is which is within the rank structure. Somebody somebody does something they shouldn't have done. It should be handled by the sergeant or the lieutenant or the captain. A lot of times those things get kicked upstairs and they turn into grievances or, or disciplinaries. And that's the stuff that, that in a lot of unions, it, it backlogs and it, it bogs down the process. So back, uh, what the heck was her name? The, the deputy undersheriff that was here from the city. Uh, not Fran Rosado, uh, LaGreca, Linda LaGreca, she was here. They brought her out here from the DA's office and she was in charge of internal affairs and we had a bunch of, a backlog of cases that, that shouldn't really have even been sitting there. They should have been handled on the command level. I remember sitting down with her and we were going to try and go through the cases, see what we could kick back to the command level. She went through it herself and she got rid of about 225 of the 275 cases, which lightened the load tremendously on the union and we were able to put our resources and our attention more to the the more important issues at hand that you know that affect people better than just some of the some of these things that I don't like they did this to me and I don't like they did that to me when it's not really a grievance it's a gripe so you know the, a lot of things started backing up again at the end of uh Mike Spizzato's tenure here we were able to get rid of a lot of things at the end of his and and now going forward with uh with Curran's uh, administration and labor relations, we have we have a, a swing back and forth relationship with the the Office of Labor Relations. Sometimes we have a very good relationship with them. Sometimes the county doesn't even staff labor relations. Uh, they're supposed to act as a liaison between the unions and the county. Um, right now, we have a men's and men's relationship with them. There's there's been a few few problems. We try to keep everything on an even keel, you know, with contract negotiations they're involved in and everything else. So sometimes it goes a little uh, cattywampus, for for lack of a better word. But you just you got to try and keep your eye on the prize and and get away from all the nonsense. But I'm sorry, I'm keep interrupting you with the with the the flow. So keep going, Brian. Not at all. Um, so again, speaking with the process. Um, once in arbitration, uh, if, for those that don't know uh, the arbitration setting, arbitration is uh, a pseudo mini court, so to speak, where the arbitrator has jurisdiction over the matter that's presented before him. Um, there'll be some testimony and evidence put in. Uh, it, there may be uh, multiple di arbitration dates. Uh, 
there after the proceeding is closed, they'll the, you know the attorneys set up uh, briefs, which is technically uh, a written summary of of what the arguments were, with additional you know information supporting um, what was discussed in the arbitration room. Uh, our contract says that once uh, the matter is closed, the briefs have been submitted. Uh, a decision is due within 30 days. Some sometimes that uh, arbitrators take a little bit longer than that. Um, the reason why all this is important is that there's a cost associated to all this. Um, arbitrators charge the, our current rate is uh, $850 due from the union, $800, $850 due from the county, $1,700 a day uh, for hearings, you know, uh, days of study days of writing and preparation time. So, you know, a, a, a very small issue could end up being thousands of dollars in arbitration costs. That leads to what we talked about earlier, those, those issues that we were able to resolve and avoid arbitration um, saved the union tremendous amount of money. You know, we resolved over a hundred cases, uh, easily saving the union membership over a hundred thousand dollars in that regard. So, over the last few years, we, we've been able to resolve a lot of issues, and we've had we've had good success. Um, since I took over uh, grievances in 2016, we've uh, kind of been consistent in the amount of grievances that we filed. In 2016, we filed uh, 30 contract grievances along with 16 disciplinary grievances. In 17, it was 21. Uh, contract grievances, 28 disciplines. In 18, we had a little drop um, with a new administration. We had eight contract grievances and three disciplines. And so far this year, we've had uh, 13 contract grievances along with four disciplines. So um, many of those have been resolved. We're, we're pretty much living in 2019 now. Uh, any new issues that were um, grieved we're going to be able to uh, put those forward for arbitration um, within this next year, um, 2019, moving into 2020. That's that, that's good. I mean, it, it shows that there's it, it, and I and I've always been a, a big proponent of the fact that there's. You know, we just had a press conference this morning about one of our officers get assaulted. That there's the uh, relationships that you have with people, relationships that you develop. Uh, with arbitrators, with labor relations, with certain people in the county, a lot of times we all have that uh, that that regular jail guard mentality where we just want to say screw you and and you know flip tables over and set the place on fire. That all has its place. It has its place in its time, and and you need to you know every once in a while you need to flex your muscle and say listen I've had enough of this crap and we you know we're going to go down a different road. But the only time that you ever really get anything done legitimately is when there's normal, calm conversations in a room and you're sitting around with people and, and everybody in the room realizes that we need to move on. We've had, uh, you know, a lot of a lot of things in the past, especially when Mike Spazzato was here with some of his craziness and then now we have uh, with, with Vera Flood that just seems to be, it's like the opposite. There's no craziness, but unfortunately with no craziness comes no action. There's a lot of stuff that just doesn't get done. Uh, but you need to have... Uh, sane-minded, calm people sitting in a room. This is this is why a lot of times you find out when people do want to make deals. Do you want to make a deal or you don't? You find out pretty quickly in a room when you sit down with, either with labor relations or the county or uh, or even some of your own people in your administration. You, you find out within the first five minutes whether or not you're all just sitting there, uh, you know, wasting time, that, that we're actually going to get something done today. We're going to do whatever we need to do. And, uh, you know, it, when people actually come to the point, even with contracts and everything else, you get to a certain point where you realize either we're not going anywhere and it's time to flip the tables over, or we're actually going to sit in a room and get something done. But that's, um, it's all part of the relationships. Uh, we're going to take a quick break for a moment. We're going to switch it up a little bit. Again, this is Nassau Coba Monthly. Uh, this month, it's Brian Sullivan, I'm the president, here with Brian Doyle and Liam uh, Castro from Kohler and Isaacs. We'll be right back. Stay up to date as to what the Nassau County Sheriff's Correction Officer Benevolent Association is up to. Visit NassauCoba.com from your phone, tablet, or PC. There, you can learn what issues Nassau's toughest law enforcement union is working on. Members can sign in on the private side of the website to get valuable benefit and services information, as well as meeting date details and charity event reminders. 
Members can also register to receive a private email called COBA Alert. News you can use to be informed members of Nassau COBA. NassauCOBA.com, the toughest job in law enforcement. NassauCOBA.com. The Nassau County Sheriff's Correction Officer Benevolent Association cordially invites the public to visit NassauCOBA.com to sign up for the COBA report. This free email goes out periodically to keep our neighbors up to date on what's going on in the Nassau County Jail. The COBA report also reports on our charity events, community outreach, and issues we face working in Nassau's toughest job in law enforcement. Visit NassauCOBA.com today to sign up for the COBA report. All right, welcome back to Nassau COBA Monthly. I am Brian Sullivan, president of the Nassau County Correction Officers Benevolent Association. I am again here with Brian Doyle, third vice president of the union. You would think after these years I would know all of that. We're also sitting here with uh, attorney Liam Castro from Kohler and Isaacs. We're going to kick into the next segment now a little bit, and I'm going to I'm going to kind of hand it over to uh, to Liam to get into. Uh, a little bit more in depth about what goes on with our, our disciplinary and grievance procedure and Brian will uh, jump in with it also. So take it over there, Liam. Let us know uh, what Great. your thoughts are. Sure. Thank you. So uh, as as uh, Brian Doyle was talking before about the grievance process uh, and about how it's important to come to the, come to the union, I want to elaborate on that uh, a little bit because members at times can solve their own problems uh, and at other times they can't. Sometimes they don't even know what their rights are, not only under the collective bargaining agreement, but their rights elsewhere. So the default, in my view, is for the member to contact the union to be guided. Um, that doesn't mean that the member is cut off from their contacts in the department and can't otherwise solve their own issue. It means they can be better educated on what their issue is under the collective bargaining agreement to the extent that it can be solved there. And to ensure that a grievance is timely filed, because four months will go by very fast with the department not answering questions of, of our members in a timely fashion. Uh, you wait too long, you may be in trouble. You're and on the outside looking in. Yeah. Absolutely. And we've seen that problem before. And beyond that, there are times where members come to us and uh, they have a bigger story, a longer story to tell and a bigger problem that be, that is beyond the collective bargaining agreement. And they don't know what their rights are beyond that. They didn't even know to ask. And we were able to identify things outside the collective bargaining agreement um, in terms of discrimination uh, that uh, they didn't even know uh, they had a specific venue to argue and a time frame that they also had to abide by. So we've educated members in, when they came to us just to understand what their rights were under the CBA beyond that. So uh, the default, in my opinion, is whether it's a gripe or a grievance, come to the union, they'll get, they'll get in touch with us when they need us, and we're happy to help. We meet with members, we understand their story, and we give them a better idea of how to solve their problem. Part of the, part of the reason why I, I wanted to do a, a segment like this today <clears throat> with the podcast is I've run into this a, a, a lot of times before where our members, uh, like I said at the top of the show, our members just don't know what their rights are. They, they, you know, a lot of people interpret in their own mind what they think is in the contract or, they're, or they'll twist it, you know, I don't want to say twist it because it sounds like it's, it's like got a, a, an attention to it, but they'll, they'll, they'll listen to other people and they'll put a spin on what they think the contract says or certain clauses in it. And it just isn't that way. So the, the, the biggest thing that, that, you know, I, I tr I'm hoping that this podcast and other things like this will do will educate our members and encourage them to read their contract, understand what's in it, know that not everything is a grievance, know that not, not every legal action that we take for them or on their behalf is necessarily delineated in the contract. There are, there are other issues, pretty much most things that we do, that's why you have a contract. But like you said about the, the discrimination issues and things like that, there's a whole forum for that outside. You have a, you know Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, you have the Human Rights Commission, we have past practices, we have a million different things. But the one thing that, that our members need should need to know when you work in the, in the public sector is be reasonably familiar with your contract and know and know what's going on. If you don't, don't hesitate to reach out to a delegate or somebody on the executive board, and we'll we'll steer you in the right direction. If you don't, if you don't know what it is, or you let it lax, uh, lapse and go down the road, 
a lot of times, sometimes we deal with irate members because they're pissed off that we have to tell them the truth. And a lot of times the truth hurts. Sometimes, you know, the, the time frames are gone or it's not in the right venue or you don't realize that the contract said this and now you're timed out. It's it, it, it's hard to tell somebody the, the, the truth sometimes and they... They're, they get all, you know, very angry at the whole situation, and, and there's not a lot you could do with them when times are passed. But sure, uh, the the worst truth to tell a member is that you you waited too long to come to us, right? And you had the ability to do file a grievance, go to perb, uh, do all the other things that you're not timed out now, timed out out, out of going. So the, the example I was given earlier about the discrimination. You know the gender, race, et cetera, is part of it. But also, we we've had subtle comments made by the administration, not necessarily this one, but you know prior years as well, where uh, the members were told things that sounded to me, but not to the member, like they were targeting them because of threat. You know, suggesting they'd go to the union, and um, they were deterred from doing so. That is not legal, even if it's with a subtle. You know, you don't really need to go to the union; just stay with us. We'll, we'll try to solve your problem. Well, that's actually illegal, <laughs> even though right. it sounds really nice. The, the, the obvious, you know, angered, you go to the union, I'm going to discipline you. For most people, it's going to trigger a thought, okay, well, that, that's a problem. That sounds wrong. That sounds illegal. It's the subtlety of don't go to the union. We'll help you. We'll, we'll fix the problem. Those things, and, they, and then they don't. Those things we would pick up on and be able to go to, to PERB and, or otherwise deal with the issue, whether, it, whether it's going to court, PERB, or filing a grievance. Especially when you're dealing with the same individuals in the, either in the administration or past administrations or people that we know that are making decisions that are either uh, making those decisions because they know it's going to benefit the administration or whatever. And, you know, I'm your, I'm your government. I'm here to help you. It doesn't exactly work. You know, don't, if you have a question or you're a little concerned, reach out to the union. That's, that's what you pay your union dues for. Don't assume that they're there only for your best interest. Assume uh, that you have the ability to be educated with the union and then with us. Assume they have the hand in your pocket. Absolutely. Could you give us a brief a brief uh, differentiation between what would be a, a grievance and an arbitration as opposed to PERB? I don't think a lot of our members realize the, the difference between that. Sure. So a grievance is defined as a claim to violation of the collective bargaining agreement. So what we look at is the collective bargaining agreement as a whole. So that would be the book that people have traditionally seen that, that, um, that's been around for a long time, and then the MOAs that have followed. Memorandums of agreement. Right, and also uh, side letter agreements and all other kinds of documents that members have access to. Maybe they've never seen them, and so therefore they, they, it's not in that, that traditional book that we've seen that's existed for a while. Now there are other documents that the members have access to that they may never have read. Those two are issues that could be grieved if there's a violation of it. So that's a contract grievance. Whereas if there is nothing in the contract whatsoever, but there's a past practice of uh, a right that a member has had uh, and or process and they stop that practice, well, that could be enforced under the tail law. And that's because it's not in the collective bargaining agreement. It's outside the CBA and it, it's a mandatory subject to bargaining. Uh, and that's where you go if it's not a grievance. You go to PERB, the Public Employee Relations Board. So I think I think it's, uh, you know, we, we hear the catchphrase past practice, and, and I know a lot of our membership uh, tags on to that, past practice, past practice. That's We hear that a lot. And it goes both ways in the CBA, that that if, it, if something, if an issue is addressed in the CBA and there's some type of past practice that otherwise contradicts it, the CBA takes precedent over that practice. And that there, there is kind of a a a check down um, of what really takes the the, the paramount issue. Um, CBA a clear and unambiguous provision within the C, CBA that's violated, obviously would be uh, first uh, before past practice would be uh, what the intent of that provision is through the bargaining history. What was it intended to mean? It may be uh, somewhat uh, unclear. What's the bargaining history behind it? And then uh, a past practice um, would also be enforceable in that regard if it you know, wasn't part of the bargaining history or- If it's uh, not delineated in your contract. Right? Correct. This right. is the way they've always paid you over the, the course of the last 30 years. We always did it on a, you know, on a Tuesday afternoon. That's, right. that's not something that's delineated in your contract and then they decide they're going to change it and we're going to pay you on a Friday afternoon and it screws up whatever. That's 
you know, maybe in a little simplistic form, that's an example of a, of a past practice, something that we've always done. And a, a lot of times I've run into that over the years with, with members that don't understand the, the difference between a grievance and, and a perb charge. I've heard people at, at general membership meetings stand up and they yell, uh, listen, that's a perb charge. You guys should file a perb charge. And they don't, they don't really know what the meaning of it is, or that's a past practice. And not, not every past practice is necessarily an ironclad case either. That's, right. you know, that's like you said about the bargaining history of everything else. I've had members come to me with, um, uh, first I want to say that, uh, don't assume that you know the contract too well. That's the union's job. You, I mean, you should know the contract well as a member, but you know, it's the union's job to every day constantly look at that CBA and constantly check that as against what the department is doing. That being said, the members are there at the front line every day, uh, and they see things that others don't. And so telling the union what's going on helps the union do its job to help the members. Also don't assume that because it's not in the CBA, it's not some, and the department does something that it's not something you can't challenge. That's the difference between a grievance and going to PERB. Uh, you know, at times I've had members come in and meet with us and, and say, well, you know, I read this law, I read that law. You know, I respect that. And frankly, I would do the same, but, you but know, they're not you, lawyers. Well, and you go, and I've done that when you have an ailment, you Google it and you, you think you have this or that and you go to the doctor and, they came at you with something from left field. It, it, they'll respect it. Like I respect people's researching of law, but this is a uh, this is our business, uh, and we can help educate you. I've had members that were on point. That being said, don't assume you're right. Go to go to come to us. Don't assume you know your CBA too well. Come to us. Don't assume that because it's not in the CBA that we can't otherwise help you. Right, and and it's funny because in the past I've ran into instances where. Uh, it, myself included, you know, you'll look at something and you'll say, I got them dead to rights on this one. And I'm making it a little simplistic again. Like I said, paragraph 1A says that this will happen when you do that. And you come in and you look, here's paragraph A. It says it right there. It's in black and white. This is an ironclad case. And somebody looks at you and says, well, look at, look at 1B. 1B just took away two thirds of what 1A is because when this happens, then you do that. And, and you get the look of everybody's like, um, yeah, uh, I've had, right, I've well. had that. I've had members say, look, it says it right there. And I said, you're absolutely right. And read the next paragraph. This happened a couple of weeks ago where I met with somebody and then you turn the page and there was something else that said that what that member thought was incorrect. And there it was in black and white. Right. And they understood that they appreciated it, but don't assume that you're 100%, absolutely 100% right. Or that, you know, what you're looking at. Just like, uh, you know, doctors know how to read MRIs and x-rays. Maybe sometimes we can tell what the difference between a bone that's not broken or not. But at times you need a professional to look at it. That's our job. That's what you pay union dues for. Right, exactly. Sometimes we have people that are uh, ex-members of our bargaining unit think they can, they're doctors and they have, uh, and they can, they can read x-rays and whatever else. But I digress. Uh did you have another issue here, Liam? That you were going to, you, do you want to talk about any of the particular cases and things like that? Yeah. Sure. So uh, the membership should by now, they, they, I'm sure they got emails, uh, the, the COBA blasts about longevity case. You know, the union signed a deal and bringing back longevity, which we thought was going to happen anyway. It was a deal to confirm that. And, and there was a quid pro quo, give this and get that from the county. So there was an exchange under the, under, with the belief that longevity was supposed to come back. We all know that longevity was remained frozen at the rate that it was when NIFA came in, and uh, we challenged that. And um, actually, the, the 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 county sued the union to try to declare that agreement va invalid, and we countersued. You mean we had a written agreement and they didn't abide by it? You know really? the the the, the agreement. <laughs> How many times we had this the other day where Brian Doyle and I were at an arbitration. And we said to the other side, how many more agreements that we have that you said you were supposed to do X that you're trying to get out of because you think it's not a valid agreement. Right. It, we, we had this the other day. So that longevity case, we, we argued that it's a valid agreement uh, it, it, to the extent that uh, you think there's any ambiguity there and we're not otherwise correct. We go to arbitration, tell the arbitrator your argument as to why you're right. And that's the process. The judge uh, agreed and said, this is a valid enforceable agreement, absolutely blowing up the county's argument. Uh, and, uh, they, they appealed. So what's going to be happening over the next few months is the county's response to the, to their appeal, their, their initial papers are going to be due. Um, and then we'll, we'll get a response and then we're going to have an oral argument. If I were to guess, that would be the fall of this year. Mm -hmm. 
And then by the end of this year or the beginning of next, we'd have an appellate division decision. Whatever they hold, they hold to the extent that they uphold the lower court's decision saying that this is a valid and enforceable agreement. We we would be at arbitration thereafter with doing what Brian Doyle was talking about before, presenting arguments to an arbitrator as to why the agreement is not only valid and enforceable, but longevity should come back. Right, exactly. Uh, before we start wrapping up this segment, I'm gonna I want to kick it over to Brian Doyle. He's going to give us a little bit of a uh, a uh, just a brief synopsis of some of the stuff that we have out there. This is uh, June of 2019. A lot of times we don't like to put uh, you know try and talk in abstracts, but just going forward so we know where we are. Uh, it's the beginning of June 2019. I'll kick it to Brian. Just give us a brief synopsis of where we are with some of our cases. So again, uh, in addition to longevity, uh, again, a, a, an important issue to the membership is also the NIFA lawsuit. Um, the, the NIFA lawsuit, again, if, if most of you should be aware, but again, is in the appellate division, is, um, is a waiting decision. Of the, of the federal court. Of the federal court, yes. Uh, is awaiting decision, and there is no time frame attached to that. Um, the federal judges take whatever time necessary to render a decision, and, and that's where we are in a waiting pattern in that regard. They're appointed for life, and sometimes they die on us. <laughs> it, it does happen. <laughs> which, which did happen which to did us happen. in this case. Yes, it did. <laughs> right, right. Um, regarding uh, the Razy Age transportation, in October of, of uh, 2018, uh, new legislation took effect um, not um, where we don't have 16-year-olds in- incarcerated in jail any longer. Um, the transportation of the, that new classified adolescent offender uh, was a subject of a stipulation that we had, uh, an MOA with the, with the department regarding transportation post-arraignment uh, of anybody arraigned in a criminal court in Nassau County that that's COBA members work. Um, the department in early two th- uh, October of 2018, uh, gave that work to the deputies. Um, we immediately filed a grievance in that regard because we do have that MOA and we've been going through, uh, various different hearings, uh, related to this case. And we do have, a a, a next day coming up in July. Um, you know, the process is the process we, 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 been in motion going through it. Uh, it in October of this year coming up, it will also include seventeen-year-olds um, as well. So any sixteen or seventeen-year-olds that we, I don't think we should have any sixteen-year-olds left, but uh, any seventeen-year-olds that we have left, they will uh, stay the remainder of their sentence. But in October of two thousand and nineteen, uh, they'll no longer be incarcerated within the jail. Still covered under that MOA is the transportation of those people. Um, and again, we're, we're something that uh, it, we feel like is our bargaining unit work uh, pursuant to that memorandum of agreement. It's something that we're going to fight um, very hard to try and keep. Something that, I, that I, it goes back ever since I started in the union too, and we've had a lot of issues before, is one, one of the biggest things, and we talk about a lot of people on our job won't remember the Bayville agreement. Uh, there was floods up in Bayville years ago, and, and they had uh, – the old administrators at the jail, they sent correction officers up there to do house-to-house searches and whatever else, and the, and the police department was was not happy with that at the time, the uh, police department, the PBA, because that's their unit work. Um, I, I do fervently agree with that, although, you know, everybody wants to expand and protect their, their jobs, but one of the things that I've always been very hot on the, on the trail of is making sure that our unit work is never farmed out to anybody else. We had that problem with former Sheriff Spazzato. He would farm our, try to farm our work out for transportation, picking up inmates in other facilities and bringing them down here because he didn't want to pay for it out of his budget. He didn't care if the cops paid for it. So that's where a lot of these, these two MOAs, memorandums of agreement came from that, that, uh, Brian Doyle was talking about because we were actually very successful in getting the, that nailed down and it's part of our contract now about exactly what our unit work is. Every union will fight to the death what their unit work is, their identified job titles. And when somebody uh, either gives it away or tries to take it away or tries to give it to somebody else for whatever their reasons are, and it's usually money, we're going we're gonna to fight to the death to keep that in our, in our bargaining unit. That's why we're here. Um, I'm hopefully that we're going to be successful on that end. And, uh, you know, did you have another issue with any of that? Just cause I wanted to, I'll start wrapping up this segment here. But, uh, one thing that I want to say is that, 
uh, Brian Doyle has been very, very hands-on, very successful in getting a lot of these things done. He's got a, he's, uh, the one thing, I've, I've been doing this union stuff in two, since 2002, and he embarrasses me sometimes because he knows where all the commas and dots are in our contract. He can he can recite a chapter and verse. He's, you know, I've been in the union a long time, but sometimes he puts me to shame, but with quoting the contract and quoting uh, laws and things like that. And I'm very happy to have him on this board because he's a hell of a resource person to have. And uh, he gets along very well with Liam. Liam, we broke, he broke his teeth with us coming out of law school with Kohler and Isaacs. He pretty much knows everything there is to know about corrections. He deals with city corrections and Brockland, another uh, correction unit. Uh, they, these, the, these guys are very knowledgeable in what they do and, and knowledge is, and, and uh, institutional knowledge and things like that. You, you just can't say enough of, you know, it's uh, – Later on, when people retire and they leave and things like that, it's it's hard because you, you don't just walk in and pick up uh, with this because you have a, a a fervent belief and you know anybody can come in and and you know want to want to do the job. But when you're when you have that type of institutional knowledge, it's something that's that's very valuable and you need to hold on to. Um, going forward, I think we're going to be we're going to be pretty successful in any future endeavors. You know, these guys did, did a hell of a job in, in wrapping up a, a load of cases in the last couple of years. When I first got in the union, like I said. Said back in 2004, we had hundreds of, of outstanding cases. We did again, you know, not too long ago, you know, when we first got into the union and, and through a lot of hard work and dedication, we were able to get a lot of cases off our plate here so we can we can put attentions on things that we that we want to instead of trying to clear the plate. You know, a lot of health and safety grievances, we can get into the contract and we could do things with this union like this podcast to get people more involved and bring this union into the future. Uh, we're going to be back in a couple of minutes. I thank uh, Brian and Liam for doing this. I'm going to wrap it up with one more little piece at the end. Again, this is Nassau Coba Monthly. I'm Brian Sullivan, president of the union. The Nassau Coba Widows and Children's Fund was established in 2006 to benefit the families of deceased Nassau County corrections officers who died while in active service in the department. Since its inception, this fund has distributed over $59,000 to the widows and or spouses of our brother and sister correction officers who have unexpectedly left us too soon. These payments are made at the time of their death to help defray some of the funeral-related costs. The fund has also helped defray some of the costs of medical hardships that our active members are experiencing. Since 2006, over $22,000 has been distributed to our active members facing need due to medical emergencies or undue hardships. You can help today by visiting nasacoba.com and find the donate button on the Widows and Children's Fund page. All right, welcome back to Nassau Coba Monthly. I am Brian Sullivan, president of the Correctional Officers Benevolent Association. Once again, we're here with Brian Doyle, third vice president of the union, and Liam Castro. We're going to wrap up the uh, the program now. I'm just going to update people on a few things that have been going on. The last couple of uh, podcasts, I got into uh, a lot of stuff that's going on in Albany and, and bail reform and all of that stuff. I just want to touch base on a couple of issues going forward. Again, I said before, this is the beginning of June. Uh, this morning, we had a the arraignment of an inmate that assaulted one of our correction officers. Uh, officer Danny Holland was viciously assaulted uh, about a week ago in uh, in the jail. Um, and and uh, I, I think, I hope everybody, or at least a lot of people on, in, the, in the jail on this job know that one of my top priorities has been the expeditious charging of, of people who commit crimes in jail, particularly when it's assaults against correction officers. Um, I've had you know, some success with this. We've gotten a lot of things done faster, but it's also, you know, if, if a police officer was to be assaulted on a street corner, the, the guy was going to be arrested that day, he'll be brought in, he'll be arraigned the next morning. Um, when it comes to the jail, a lot of times the, uh, the, 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 the system looks at it like the inmate is already in, he's not going anywhere. So, uh, the, the guy that assaulted Danny Holland is actually in on a, on some heavy duty charges. He's in on $500,000 bail for rape in the first and a bunch of weapons charges and endangering the welfare of a child and, and, uh, other assorted lesser sex crimes. So he's not going anywhere, but it still shows you that there's a problem in the system where he's not brought down immediately. You know, after the incident or as soon as practicable, the old favorite contract word and fingerprinted and and brought to arraignment right away. You know, we had an incident in the in the 
e-visiting room yesterday where a guy tried to pass uh, some contraband to an inmate. He was actually brought to arraignment court today. That's a good thing. But then when we have a, an assault like this, in the past, over you know several years, I've seen and we've all seen where there's pending charges against an inmate and he walks out the door on his original charges and then they got to go chase him down with warrants. That's unacceptable. We, we can't allow that to happen, when, especially when the guy is already in the system. How does the system let him out? There's, there's a few things that I still have in the, in the fire to try and get this done expeditiously. We're trying to get more people in our criminal investigative unit. We're trying to get uh, things married up with our, with our uh, fingerprint machines, with the ID unit, with the, uh, with the police department. I don't have any resistance. It's just the idea of getting the stuff in here and getting the, the, the kinks worked out. Sometimes the DA's office hasn't been very uh, cooperative with with things, so I got to keep prodding them. But uh, you know, it is what it is. They're the only game in town. You got to do it. So we were over there today. One of the things that I keyed on also is when some of our officers get uh, assaulted, we bring them over there and they'll they'll hit the inmate with a uh, with a nice bail. I wasn't too happy today. It was only fifty thousand. The the prosecutor asked for a hundred thousand. They hit him with a fifty thousand dollar bail from the judge, but. Uh, you know, that's, I'll, I'll leave that where it is. I, I could talk for an hour on, on, on that, but the inmate's not going anywhere. He's held on a $500,000 bail. That's the main thing. And we're going to, we're going to follow up on his subsequent cases. The things that we've had the problems in the past is that an officer will get assaulted. They'll bring him in. They'll char- they'll do charges. We had an angel, uh, we had an inmate named Angel Hernandez that was in jail on some very serious charges outside. Allegedly, he shot up a house in Hempstead and, he, you know, all kinds of things like that. They brought him in and the case outside actually fell apart. Well, whether it involved witnesses deciding not to show up and things like that, whatever the, this, this case that you have outside, and he ends up taking a plea. The thing that I'm not happy when it comes to the to the DA's office is that they'll they'll make plea bargains with these individuals, but a lot of times, and especially this guy Angel Hernandez, he uh, he wouldn't take the plea unless it unless it rolled in the assault of our officer. He knocked out one of our officers in the visiting room, knocked him unconscious, had to be taken out in the visiting room. They they roll his original case that started falling apart in with the assault, and he ends up getting one to three. He should get one to three, just at least for the assault on the correction officer, let alone the other heinous charges that he was in. In my mind, he should get at least two to four for, for assaulting a correction officer or something like that. Um, but when we start doing all this, you know, the way the world is changing and, and uh, the way, you know, the, 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 the social mores are changing and law enforcement is, is the enemy and we're all the devil walking around, nobody gives a crap what happens to law enforcement. You go around, it's, it's, it seems like some people think it's okay to take pot shots at correction officers and cops and probation officers and court officers. Well, we don't. We don't think it's acceptable at all. So the one thing that I, I said at the press conference this morning and then, and, and Brian, you were there. Is is that we can't we can't allow these things to go w- without at least screaming from the rooftops that these people that commit these crimes in a jail they should be held they should be held accountable for it. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, uh, I think I think you had referenced it. You know, uh, somebody commits a crime within a jail, assaults one of us, and essentially they never. They never have to face the music regarding to it. You know, it's it's oftentimes rolled into their existing case, and it and it, it sends a message to the inmate population and even to the membership that you know it's a free shot. It's a free shot on one of us, and that that's no way um, to treat correction officers. You know, we're certainly making a stand in that regard. We we need everybody else in in the criminal justice system to hear us loud and clear. This, this is something that people got to be held accountable for. We're not there as punching bags. We're, we're not there to, to get free assaults. Uh, you know, inmates have to be held accountable for, for their actions. You know, it it's, can't be washed away with other with their other charges. There, there are those out there that, that they look at us and I've actually had it said to me over the years is that, well, you guys got to expect that in the job like that. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't expect to come to work and have somebody punch me in the face every time I come to work. Do I know it's a reality that you're going to be in there? I've worked, you know, some some shitty floors in this place. I've been here a long time. I worked in every building. I worked in almost every unit. Uh, yeah, you know that there's a possibility that could that there could be some sort of an attack, some sort of a violent thing. You take that uh, things those precautions into hand. But I certainly don't come to work saying, I wonder how I'm going to get assaulted today. I wonder if I get assaulted, if anybody's going to back me up. If I get assaulted, you know, walk 
walking around doing a routine patrol like Danny Holland was, is some inmate going to jump up out of his chair, punch me in the face, and I'm going to get six or eight stitches in my face and screw up my shoulder or whatever else. And yeah, he said it today. He actually thought he was he was looking around because he couldn't see. He thought his eyeball came out. Right. It, it's that that's that's not something you want to think about when you're leaving your wife and kids in the morning. He's a veteran officer, and and who goes to their office and and thinks that there you know there's a possibility I might come home tonight without my eyeball or or I might come home with a with a neck brace on or whatever. We know there are inherent dangers in this, and with those inherent dangers that we accept the responsibility for, we expect the the system to back us up. We don't expect the you know paper shuffles that allow people to walk out with six months or a year after committing these types of crimes against us. And we all know, if anybody follows me on Facebook, we all know I'm I'm surprised I don't have Crown Vicks following me around because I've been I've been naming names and, and calling people out all the time from from Cuomo and our and our local senators on down. The the way things are changing in this state, it's they're it's like they're rewriting a criminal's bill of rights. Anybody with a uniform on is the enemy. And to me, public safety is the enemy of some of these people that are pushing these agendas. Uh, you know, this, to me, some of the lesser stuff, believe it or not, is allowing a, a, a felon to serve on a, on a jury. That's, that's horrible enough as it is. Five or ten years ago, people would be jumping up and down screaming, how could you let a convicted felon serve on a jury? I got to be honest with you, that's about number seven on my list. Why are we letting out cop killers and giving them the right to vote? Why are we letting out Judith Clark, a, a terrorist who was who took part in, was the one that obtained the weapons for the Brinks heist years ago up on, yes, the Tappan Zee Bridge? Those, those, those two cops in that Brinks guard are still dead. This woman's out and they're making it look like she's a kindly old grandmother or whatever else. I don't, they should have gave her the electric chair 30 years ago. She shouldn't be here. Yeah, you know? the the uh, the term that we hear, criminal justice reform, is really an injustice to to the the average day citizen. People who are held accountable for crimes, and now all of a sudden, uh, are supposed to be that's supposed to be undone, and we're supposed to be, uh, you know, compassionate regarding the crimes that they committed. You know, it, it's it's near insanity where we're we're heading in this regard. Right. The I've I've had several conversations with some of our some of our senators that that have that uh, that voted in favor of bail reform. And and for anybody that's listening out there, don't kid yourself. Bail reform is not pending legislation. It's not something out there that's being discussed. This has already passed. It was passed in the New York State budget, and it's law as of January first, twenty twenty. All misdemeanors and all nonviolent felonies in New York State, you're going to get a desk appearance ticket for. You don't get arrested. If you don't appear to court, they can't go and get you. They have to wait 48 hours to see if somebody will get you on the phone and ask you to please come back to court. If you willfully and persistently refuse to come back to court, then they can go and get you and they can they can remand you or they can do bail. What's willful and persistent? I've said it a bunch of times. Is it twice, three times or 25, 30 times? We, we, you've seen, you know, how many times that there's there's people driving around in cars that, that have, you know, 35 suspensions of their licenses and they just drove on a sidewalk and they killed 10 people. The guy that was in court today, the, this guy uh, Bassoon that assaulted Danny Holland, he they they read off his prior charges. He has three prior felony convictions. Yes, he's in jail, and and it's and and it obviously it's different than if he was doing something on the street. He has three felony convic- prior felony convictions. He's got violent crimes that he that he's in jail for now. Uh, these these non there are, there are certain crimes you know it just shows you what goes on these these are people that are actually in the system these are people that are actually walking around out in the streets that are com- why is this guy out being able to commit a rape and and carrying weapons and and endangering the welfare of a child when he has three prior felony convictions yeah we, we learned also today that that he had um, issues with parole and 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 uh, probation and violations in those regards. Right. This is somebody that simply does not play well with others, and you know he's he's in the system, reoccurring time and time again. Right. Does anybody know what a nonviolent felony is? Because this is going on out uh, out in the open without anybody really paying attention as to who could be released on what a nonviolent felony is. I can tell you right now that I I almost guarantee you that every legislator in New York State doesn't know the nonviolent felonies that they approved in this in the budget process and it was done through the budget process so that there were no public hearings that's why a lot of this was done thanks to you i looked at the list in more detail and i i, I could not believe what these people think 
are nonviolent are felonies. nonviolent crimes. It's, it's I, absurd. I, I've actually been dealing with some of our some of our uh, electeds who are who are now. You know, some of them have actually told me that we didn't realize what was in this bill. We didn't realize what was, you know, we, we got we to gotta try and walk this back. We got to do something. This is craziness. We, gotta, we, don't, we didn't realize that this was there. And, and to me, how do you not realize something that you're voting on when you have a, a nonviolent – you want to hear a couple of nonviolent felonies? If I can ever get my glasses off. A nonviolent felony in New York State, uh, money laundering for the purposes of supporting terrorism – in New York State, money laundering for the purposes of supporting terrorism. Anybody remember the World Trade Center? I do. I was there. A lot of people are forgetting these things already. That's a nonviolent felony. You could get a desk appearance ticket for that. Hopefully, Selling, hopefully they come back. And hopefully they come back, right. Hopefully they don't disappear into the into the underworld again and do whatever else and actually get their, get their terroristic things done before they, they're supposed to come back for their court date that they don't show up for. Um, selling drugs, selling weapons to minors on school grounds. That's a nonviolent felony. Escape is a, is, is a nonviolent felony. Bail jumping, yep. we talked about it before. Bail jumping is a nonviolent crime that when you get arrested for bail jumping, they're going to give you a desk appearance ticket and send you on your way. It's absurd. That's two it's, DATs for not showing up. It's, it's, <laughs> exactly. You just you, you disappear. Every the, the biggest thing that we have here, I could go on and on, criminal sales of, of, of prescriptions and, this and all, all different kinds of things. The, the biggest thing that sticks out in my, in my head and should stick out in every single person's head on Long Island, we have this opioid crisis that is being fueled by, you know, in, in large part by MS-13 gangs that are bringing this stuff in here. And they, you know, if you got MS-13 tattooed on your forehead, I don't think you really give much of a crap about public safety or, or the average Joe walking around the street. But A1, a major drug trafficking, is the only drug crime in New York State that you could be held, remanded for, or given a bail. Every single other drug possession and drug sales charge, B, C, D, E felonies, every single one is a desk appearance ticket. So you could be driving around with pounds of heroin, fentanyl in your car. You're selling drugs to every kid in every school in your neighborhood. You get arrested, you don't get arrested. You get stopped, you get a desk appearance ticket. Please, Mr. Drug Dealer, come back in 30 days or whatever. Come get fingerprinted. It's like shoplifting. This nonsense they started uh, about whatever it was, two or three years ago when you're, when you're shoplifting in a department store – because they wanted to cut down on the paperwork and, and keep the cops out on the street to a certain extent, I can see that. But you, you're, you're in for shoplifting to give you a desk appearance ticket in the parking lot of Green Acres Mall. Now, if you're in the middle of Green Acres Mall and you got a van there and you're selling 10 pounds of heroin to people, you're going to get a desk appearance ticket instead of, instead of being arrested and hopefully you come back. We've spoken about this in the past, about the ripple effect of these uh, these changes in law, like uh, with the raise the age, you know, where, you know, Crime kingpins then, you know, look at uh, juveniles or adolescent offenders, as it would be called now, and say, hey, you know, these people can't be held accountable criminally anymore. So we're going to focus in on them and have have them do our deeds. Uh, similar to these, uh, the the drug charges here, the A kingpins, you, you, you're no longer going to get. They're going to, you know, they're going to learn. They're going to down. They're going to navigate their way around it. And, and it's, it's going to have... A, a tremendous effect on on the communities where we live. That's that's a that's a very good point that you bring up. We've seen that because you you know we've got a lot of years on the job. We've seen these gangs use minors, they use children to to peddle this crap out on the street because they know, especially like MS thirteen, they know that people that are underage are not going to be in the system. So that's their that's their method of distribution. So. What you know, we look at our good friend Bill De Blasio in the city. What's his his uh, his recommendation la last week that came out that we're not going to hold uh, uh, adolescent offenders for robbery in the first anymore. We're just going to let them go. It, you're, you're, now you're not only are you are you have them people selling drugs. You're going to have gangbangers sending adolescents into department stores, into homes to rob people because they know they're not going to be held. They're going to be set out, and and if they do catch them, they're going to let them go. It's scary times, scary it's, it's, times. It's, 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 the world is upside down, folks. And uh, that's it. We're going to wrap it up for this month. Again, this is Coba Nassau, uh, Nassau Coba Monthly. I want to thank Brian Doyle, the third vice president of the union. Say goodbye, Brian. Goodbye. <laughs> Liam Castro from Kohler and Isaacs. Thank you for coming in. I really appreciate you taking the time. Thanks for having me. We'll see you next month. We had Kevin Curtin out in the hallway. I was trying to get him back in. I'm, I'm sorry. We, you know, Unfortunately, we're going to have to bump him again one more time, but I, I think he understands. He'll, uh, we'll get him in here in the next, uh, the next program, I promise. Take care, everybody.